Ikkyo. Some of the screens are still coming up, but at least you can see the main one. That's the important one. Very good. Thank you there. So here's our outline. You saw this slide last week, and you know we began up here with the introduction and the call of the prophet. Uh, we talked about that last week from chapters 1 through chapter 3. And that was his commissioning. That was his first vision. And you remember we talked about the, the, when he saw the four creatures standing together on top of a wheel, inside of a wheel, and then on top of the four creatures with four heads was a platform. And on that platform was the throne of God. And, and Ezekiel got to see that glory of God in that vision in chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, God says, here, take this scroll and eat it. And this is, this is my words that you are to eat and then you are to speak um, as I've told you to speak. That was chapter 2, and it finishes up at the beginning of chapter 3. And we, we ended last week at, at the, the very beginning of chapter 3. We didn't finish chapter 3 last week, but, but that was the, the introduction, and that was the commission of Ezekiel the prophet. And after that introduction phase up here in paragraph 1, there's basically three major sections of the book. The first part is his oracles against Judah and Jerusalem, which we're going to talk about tonight. And then the second part is oracles against foreign nations, which is down the road. And it's kind of interesting that almost every prophet that we talked about, including Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and many of the minor prophets as well, all had oracles against some of the foreign nations. God cared about them as well as caring about uh, Israel and Judah. And of course, the final part of this is in chapter 33 through 48, where he gives oracles of hope and redemption. Um, there, is a, there is a good message at the end of Ezekiel. So that's the book in a, in a, in a very high-level overview. And as you can see, I added uh, subparagraph A tonight. We're going to talk about his first prophecy. And that prophecy is about the destruction of Jerusalem. And you can find that in chapters 4 and 5. It's all, both chapters cover this one story. And we're going to look at both chapters tonight, kind of as one unit. Now, here's the timeline. You've seen it before. We talked about this last week. And you know, we've started off looking at Isaiah. Then we added Jeremiah in green. Last week, we added Ezekiel in yellow. And I'll remind you of this area up here where... There's a lot of overlap between the time of, of Jeremiah and the time of Ezekiel. They were contemporaries. And also notice there that right in the middle of that overlap is the destruction of Jerusalem. And even though Ezekiel was known as the prophet in Babylon and he preached to the, the exiles, a lot of what he spoke happened before the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and in fact, you're going to see that tonight. So it's good to keep this slide in mind because we're talking about what happens tonight is happening right here at the very early part of Ezekiel's ministry prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Because he's going to talk about Jerusalem being destroyed um, in chapter 4. Okay, here's a slide you saw last week. This is the overview of the biography of Ezekiel. Um, just for review's sake, I'll point out a couple things. Um, he was from Judah or Jerusalem. That's where he grew up. He came with a group of exiles when he was about 26 years old, to Babylon. And he starts his ministry in Babylon at age 30. And he lives the rest of his life in Babylon. And for everything else we know about him, uh, happens in Babylon. Uh, but he grew up in, in Jerusalem and in Judah. Um, the other things about here was he was both a priest and a prophet. He refers to himself that way several times. And then notice at the very bottom... In the, the red circle, Isaiah's kind of known for some bizarre actions. And we're going to look at the first of those tonight. Um, and it's, not, it's kind of bizarre in the sense of some outsider looking at him. But for those of us that know the backstory, and we're going to see that as we read through chapter 4, that he's doing what God told him to do. So it wasn't like he was a real crazy person. Uh, because he was acting out and doing what God instructed him to do. But to a casual observer there in Babylon who sees this, this is weird behavior. 
So, okay. Now, before we can actually get into chapter 4, we need to read a couple of verses at the end of chapter 3 to really kind of get the setting and understanding of, of what 4 is all about. So in chapter 3 at the end, let's start at chapter, uh, excuse me, at verse 22 down to the end of the chapter when it says, Then the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he said to me, Arise and go into the plain, and there I shall talk to you. So I arose and went out into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, like the glory which I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell on my face. Then the Spirit entered me and, I, and set me on my feet, and spoke to me and said to me, Go shut yourself inside your house, and you, O man, son of man, surely they will put ropes on you and bind you with them, so that you cannot go out among them. And pay attention to verse 26. This is kind of the whole key that's kind of going to set us up for chapter 4. I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth so that you shall be mute and not be one to rebuke them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth and you shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, He who, he who hears, let him hear. For he who refuses, let him refuse. For they are a rebellious house. Okay. The point is, in chapter 3, God doesn't let his prophet speak. He basically makes him mute, unable to speak. So everything we're going to go through and see in chapter 4, keep in mind, this is a, a silent prophet at this point. Now, eventually, God's going to let him speak at the end of chapter 5, when we get down there. But, but most of what we're going to see tonight, through all of chapter 4 and most of chapter 5, is done in silence. And that's going to really point forward a, a lot about what the message is that he's trying to, to convey. So as we move ahead here into chapter 4, chapter 4 starts out with, with God giving him some instructions. He says, you also, son of man, take a clay tablet, and some translations will say a brick. Don't think about a, a brick as we know, a brick that's about this size. Think of a bigger brick, bigger brick or a, a larger stone, maybe the size of a tombstone, or you know, something about this size or so. Not, a, not a, Mer a modern American brick. Take a clay tablet and lay it before you. Portray, portray on a, a city, Jerusalem. Lay siege against it. Build a siege wall against it. And heap up a mound against it. Set camps against it also. And place battering rams against, all, against it all around. Moreover, take for yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city. Set your face against it, and it shall be besieged. And you shall lay siege against it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. Okay, let's, let's stop there for a second. And let's catch up to what the picture is going on. First of all, this is our silent prophet. Think of a game of charades. I'm sure you've all played that. You've drawn a, a word or a phrase, and you have to act it out without using any spoken words. Well, this is kind of what the prophet's doing. And he's told, and God's telling him how to do it. Because he said, go get, your, go get this plate tablet and draw on it a map. That's not necessarily the one he had, that's just a picture. But make it look like Jerusalem. Outline the wall of Jerusalem. Put on it some of the key landmarks. Put, put a mark where the temple was. And put a mark where the, the city gate was. Put a mark where the pools are. So anybody that was there in Babylon with Ezekiel, on any other exiles, they had come out of Jerusalem. You know, if they walked by, they saw this little sketch. There wasn't a doubt in their mind what they were looking at. Anybody that had lived in Jerusalem and now was over in Babylon could have seen that little sketch of a map and say, okay, this is definitely Jerusalem. I've, I've been there. Okay, so, so this is what he's trying to show. So take this stone, lay out the map, a nice sketch with enough detail to show what it is, where it is, and then get out your little green army men, lay them around the stone, and, and lay siege on the city. And he's, obviously he didn't have green or plastic army men. But that's how we would have done it if it was in our day and time, right? But he would have still had things that would have like sticks or rocks or stones, and he would have laid it around this, this tablet to represent these little army men 
that represented the, the, the army of the Babylonians as they were going to lay siege upon Jerusalem. And, you know, God tells them, well, I guess before I get too far, there's a modern day version, okay? Just to show you that the army of today still uses this concept. That's a, a modern day sand table with probably a battalion S3 explaining to the company commanders what the next mission is going to look like. And of course, they're laying out little roads, little army men, little, little blocks for buildings or whatever to depict the same kind of story of, of how they're going to execute their next mission. So it's, it's something that's actually still used um, quite often today. So God tells them, take this clay tablet, lay it out before you, portray the city on it, lay siege on it, representing what the Babylonian army is about to do. Set up battering rams, put up a mound, set up the little camps around the city. And then he says, take a plate, take an iron plate, and set it up between you and the city. Set your face against it, and it'll be besieged. You will lay siege against it, and it'll be assigned to the house of Israel. Okay, so now that he's got this, this sand table all set up, the city laid out, the city's under siege by these little green army men, what does God tell him to do? Lay down. Lay on your left side. And lay in the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of days, 390 days. So you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel, and when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah for 40 days. I have laid on you a day for each year. Therefore you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and your arm shall be uncovered, you shall prophesy against it, and surely I will restrain you, so that you cannot turn from one side to another till I have ended the days of your siege. Okay, so now he's laying down next to this, this sand, sand table, this map. Starts off on his left side for 190 days. 390 days, excuse me, thank you. And then an additional 40 days on his right side. Now, it's not 24-7 where he can never get up. And we know that because down a few verses later he has them fixing some food. So he was certainly allowed to get up and at least eat. Um, you know, but, but his main job was laying down next to this thing for the next 14 months. That's... You know, when you think about those days, that's a little over a year. Now, the next question is, where do these, all these numbers of these days come from? And the answer is, I really don't know. Uh, I tried to give you some explanation here. I'm not sure they're all that great of an answer, but I'll share with you what I have. First of all, the, the 390... Ezekiel 4.4 4 says that was the amount of time of Israel's iniquity. And we're talking about the northern kingdom, which has already been wiped out by the Assyrians probably 200 years before. Okay? Now, one, one possibility here is that 390 days, which are really years, right? Because he's, he's laying down for one day for every year, may start all the way back at the first sign of apostasy by King Jeroboam of the Northern Kingdom, who was the first king of the Northern Kingdom, up to the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. So if you take the, we know the day of the destruction of Jerusalem, if you count back 390 years, you're back actually prior to the split of the two kingdoms, you know, very right before that happens. So that's one option. The second one talks about the amount of time the, the city's under siege. In Jer uh, Jeremiah 52, it says the city was under siege for 18 months. But we know in the middle of that, the Babylonian army kind of pulled away from the city 
because they saw movement from the Egyptian army, and this is in Jeremiah 37. So there's a little bit of a gap there. So if you subtract five months from the 18, that's about the same amount of, of time. That, that one seems like the weakest argument to me because it seems really more about the northern kingdom, um, the way I kind of read Ezekiel. But what about the 40 days? This one's probably the easiest one, for, in my mind, to kind of put together because if we think about 40 years of iniquity, if you look at the time from the time of Jerusalem's destruction, going back 40 years, what happened then? Well, that was at the time of Josiah and his big reforms. So we went from a time of, of, of major religious reform in the time of Josiah, which, which was also the same time as Jer Jeremiah was starting to prophesy, if you recall. So we had 40 years of Jeremiah's ministry, ending roughly at the same time as the destruction of Jerusalem. That's a 40-year span. So that's kind of where I would probably tie together the 40 years for the southern kingdom. Now, if you put the two together, this is kind of an interesting concept. By the way, none of these concepts are original to me. All of them are from different commentaries. You take it for what it's worth. But the, the, the one at the bottom says, okay, if you put the two together, you add the 390 and the 40, you get uh, 430 days. What happens if you look forward from the time of Ezekiel going forward 430 days, where are you going to be? Well, you're going to be around year 156. And then if you ask yourself, what's happening at the year 156? That's at the time of the Maccabean revolt, which was the time when a group, the Maccabee family, revolted against the Greeks, who at that point had taken over uh, the area. And at that point is the, really the first time in, in centuries that the Jewish nation actually had their own freedom, where they didn't have some enemy foreign national power looking over their heads. So they had a little break of freedom. It was short-lived, maybe 100 years or so, before the Romans moved in, and they were under Roman rule. So was that a, a, con, a, a foreshadowing of, of time of, of freedom? I don't know. But anyway, I share those thoughts with you tonight. Get back to chapter 4. In verse 8 highlighted in green, is a very interesting passage. And I don't want us just to pass over this one. It says, And surely I will restrain you so that you cannot turn from one side to another till you have ended the days of your siege. Okay, this is the, at the end of, after he tells him, okay, set up your, your sand table, lie down on your left side, and then... He says, I'm going to bound you and restrain you. Some of the translations will say, you know, just talk about having ropes and t binding them up, like tying them down. Um, this is the, uh, the New King James, which says, I will, surely I'll restrain you. I don't think those are literal ropes. Because he still, see, he still had the freedom to get up and eat. Um, and, and do those kind of things, sort of what appeared to be kind of at will. But yet, if you think about, how, if you were to lie down on, on your left side for an extended period of time, I doubt you could do it very long. M minutes, yeah. Hour, maybe. But it won't take too long until your arm starts to get numb and your hip starts to get sore and... You know, it's like, eh, I can't really lay on this side much longer. But if you're going to ask Ezekiel to do this for, for hours every day, let's say he just did it eight hours a day like, like we would do on a, one of our jobs, that's still pretty taxing on, on you. But if you were supported up with some ropes and God was helping you do that, because he's saying he's the one doing it. He's not going to have someone else tie ropes around you and hog tie it down. God's going to make your, 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 your task a little bit lighter. You know, and I think he's using those ropes and those tie downs as kind of a metaphor for, hey, I'm going to support you. I'm going to lift you. I'm going to make that job a little bit lighter. And I think that's exactly what's going, kind of going on here. And I think just how Ezekiel was able to handle this 
for over a year, day in and day out, day in and day out. And it's kind of like what it says in Matthew 11, verse 30, where he says, my yoke is easy and my burden's light. See, God's using this ropes to help support him. This isn't the Gulliver's Travel picture where you see the guy laying down with a thousand ropes across him and he's just stuck there. You know, I don't, I don't picture that as being Ezekiel. I picture Ezekiel as being, hey, I'm being supported and lifted up and held in place by the strength of God in, a, in this something that he's described that's sort of like a rope um, to make, make the, the efforts a little bit easier. Verse 9. Also take for yourself wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and speff, and put them into one vessel and make bread for th of them for yourself. During the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days you shall eat it. And your food which you eat shall be by weight 20 shekels a day. There's the bread. Some of you are laughing. Some of you are saying, I've seen this before. This is, this is not a joke, actually. Um, some of you may have even seen this or eaten it. You can actually buy that in just about any major grocery store in town. It is a real brand of bread. It is, if you haven't seen it, you can find it in the frozen section of the store, not your fresh bread aisle. That's why you may have overlooked it. But it is called Ezekiel bread, and it's named after Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 9, which is the verse that we're reading. And they claim to make it out of the same um, six grains that are spelled out here in verse 9. So that's where that actually comes from. However, I think the meaning behind it is a little bit different than in the case of Ezekiel. Because in the next verse, it says, you know, during, the, during these days that you lie on your side, 390 days you shall eat it, and your food which you eat shall be by weight, 20 shekels a day from time to time you shall eat it, and you shall drink water by measure, one-sixth of a hen, from time to time you shall drink. And you shall eat it as barley cakes and bake it using fuel of human waste in their sight. Okay. Now, most of you probably have no idea how much a, a 20 shekels of bread would be or a one-sixth of a hen of water. But that's about seven or eight slices of bread a day. It's about a quart of water. Okay. That's not a lot of food. That's barely above a starvation diet. If you took seven or eight slices of bread and divided it by three meals a day, you're only going to get about two loaves of bread or two slices of bread a meal. And you're not even getting any peanut butter and jelly to go on that bread. And you got to remember Babylon is a modern day Iraq where it's quite hot and you need a lot more than a quarter of water a day. You probably need a quarter of water almost an hour um, if you're going to do any kind of activity out in that kind of sun. So God's limiting him quite a bit in the amount of food that he's allowed to eat during this duration while he's laying on his sides. Um, but he's allowed, obviously allowed, he's allowed to get up and make it and cook it. And he's, so he doesn't have to be laying on his side, you know, 24 hours a day. So it's a little bit different than the, uh, the picture of the loaf of bread, which is obviously marketed as something very healthy and nutritious. But in the case of Ezekiel, it was something that was bare subsistence. But why? Why not let Ezekiel have a, a bigger meal? You know, if, if that's the only thing you were eating for the next year, you're probably going to lose a lot of weight and, and barely make it. But this whole, this whole 
exercise or this game of charades of him sitting around the city of Jerusalem, from the fact of the way it's laid out to the fact of the way he's putting siege on that city, you know, he's an actor in this production. And remember, he's silent. He's not explaining what he's doing. But if you as an audience were walking by and, and saw him day after day, you know, laying on his left side with his little green army men putting siege upon this city, and then you see him eating just very small measured quantities of food. In fact, he says right there that, that you're going to put that food on a scale. And you're going to eat it by weight. You know, very little amount of grain, and yet he's going to measure it out very precisely. But he's telling the people what it's going to be like in Jerusalem when the real siege happens. It's coming up. It's, it's right around the corner. It's, getting, it's imminent. And at some point, the Babylonian army is going to actually be surrounded the city of Jerusalem, and lay siege upon it. And at that point in time, food and water is going to be very scarce. And at that point, the food and water is going to be rationed very tightly. Because, you know, when the, when the army surrounds a city, and it's a big walled city, and the people inside don't want them to come in, and people outside don't want them to come out, one of the best ways to take the city is to starve them out. And you remember, they laid siege on Jerusalem for 18 months, according to Jeremiah. So for 18 months, they, the only way to eat is what they had at the beginning, which, of course, obviously they had food and livestock and stuff at the beginning, but over time, that gets less and less, and you get to the point where you've got to really ration that food. And Ezekiel's, God, through Ezekiel, is showing this is what it's going to be like back in Jerusalem at the time. <clears throat> in fact, not only do things like food and water get to be hard to come by when the city's under siege, so is fuel. You know, we think about our f fuels today, but they would have still needed some kind of fuel to cook with. You know, they probably want some kind of lighting. You know, obviously we've probably been burning maybe burning firewood or burning oil or something like that, those things are going to be scarce as well. You know, how are you going to cook? Well, God tells Ezekiel, use, burn human waste. And here's the next point where Ezekiel says, mm, I don't think so, God. You know, <laughs> you know, he has a little bit of an objection here in the next verse. Now, it's not coming from a position of, of complaining, it's a, coming from a position of conscience, all right? You know, he says, um, Oh, Lord God, indeed, I have never defiled myself from my youth until now. I have never eaten what has died of itself or was torn from beast, nor uh, the abominable flesh ever come over into my mouth. You know, he's saying, Look, I've, never, I've always followed your rules. You know, the, the Levitical rule says you don't eat those things. And, and Ezekiel's telling God, Look, I've been following your rules. You know, I was the one that was training to be a priest, and, and now I'm ready to be a priest, and I'm no longer in Jerusalem with the temple. But I'm still doing your, what, your, what you told me to do, God. And God recognizes this is not just a pure complaint. This is actually, I think, a little bit on his conscience. And God backs off. He says, okay, you can use the, the animal dung. Um, I'll, I'll let you have this one. So, and then he said to me, see, I'm giving you cow dung instead of human waste, and you shall prepare your bread over it. So he does. All right, no more complaining from Ezekiel. He, he moves on, cooks his bread, um, and, and he does so, you know, for the next 13 months. As he lies on his side and he, he measures out his, his six grains. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, surely I will cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem, they shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety, and shall drink water by measure and with dread, that they may lack bread and water and be dismayed with one another and waste away because of their iniquity. 
This is what's going to happen in Jerusalem, and it's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be nice. It's not going to be a good place to be when the siege begins. <clears throat> that ends chapter 4. Chapter 5 is a continuation. So there's a, even though your Bible gives you a chapter break here, it's really one continuous story. The next part, he says, <coughs> Son of man, take a sharp sword. Take it like a barber's razor and pass it over your head and over your beard, and then take scales to weigh and divide the hair. Okay, so he's going to cut it, make Ezekiel cut his hair. So he's going to take all the hair off his head, off his beard, and he's going to you know, lay it out here. And then he says, you're going to take, put it in three piles. One third, one third, one third. And then he said, you'll, you'll take and burn with fire one third in the middle of the city. In the days the siege are finished. And you should take one third and strike it with a sword. And one third you will scatter it in the wind. I will draw out a sword after them. You shall also take a small number of them, bind them in the edge of your garment. Then you shake some of them again and throw them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For there a fire will go out into the house of Israel. Okay, so the, the scene is still set. He still has this tablet of the map of Jerusalem in the center. He still has all these little green army men around him. He's got laying siege on the city. Now he takes a piece of his hair, divides it in three piles, takes one pile, puts it in the middle of the city, sets it on fire. And what does the hairs represent? It's going to be the people. One third of the people are going to die in this. They're going to be killed in the siege. One third. You shall burn one with fire one third in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are finished. Then you shall take one third and strike it against around with a sword. One third is going into captivity. And one third is going to be scattered. And God's going to draw the sword and kind of, kind of go after them. So the people are going to be the people are going to be scattered. Some people are going to die in the city. Some people are going to be captives and go off to Babylon. And some of them are may just be scattered around. And then he says, "Take a few take a few hairs." And, and you're going to take this small little group and you're going to stitch them into the hem of your robe. But even then, take a couple Pull a couple of those hairs out, and a couple of those are going to get burned too. Because even some of them are end up going to die. But yet, there is still a remnant that's going to be saved. This wasn't the end. God's still going to preserve his, his people in the hem of the garment. It's going to be a small number, but there is a group that's going to be saved at the end. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. Okay. Remember, up to this point, it was a game of charades. For 13 months, we saw him lay out this scene and lay next to it and lay siege upon this city and eat tiny bits of food. And, and people walking by were observing this odd behavior. But now God's letting him speak and really explain what is happening. And the Lord says, this is Jerusalem. I've set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. She has rebelled against my judgments by doing wickedness more than the nations, against my statutes more than the countries that were all around her, for they have refused my judgments, and they have not walked by my statute. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have multiplied disobedience more than the nations that were all around you, all the nations that are all around you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Indeed, I, even I, am against you, and I will execute judgments in your midst in the sight of the nations, and I will do among you what I have never done, and the like of which I will never do again, because of all your abominations. Therefore, fathers, shall eat their sons in their midst, and the sons shall eat their fathers. 
and I will execute judgment among you, and all of you will remain. I will scatter to all the winds. All right, let's stop right there for a second. All right, he points out several things here. One is he compares them to the other nations. He sets them in the middle. He first by says, I, I'm, I put your country right in the center, where east meets west, you know, major directions, north, south. You, know, you can't hardly get to Jerusalem going east or west without going through Jerusalem or going down to Africa without passing through Jerusalem. They were in the center. They were the key place. And, and all these nations around them didn't have the, uh, the, the Mosaic law or the tabernacle. But yet, God's saying, they were better behaved than you guys were. And you had my law. What's wrong, Israel? Why didn't you follow it when the other nations that were so evil and, and ungodly that didn't have my law, they're acting better than you are? And God's saying, because of all this, Israel's being destroyed. Because of your disobedience and your abominations. And we talked about the word abomination a few weeks ago, and it's almost always used in the Old Testament referring to idolatry. You know, it's almost synonymous. And no doubt that's how it's probably being used here. So your idolatry was an abomination against me. In fact, then he ends with that paragraph talking about how bad the food's even going to be. These people are going to start going to cannibalism back in Jerusalem just to eat and survive. It's going to be that bad. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore I will also diminish you. My eye will not spare, nor will I have any pity. One third of you shall die of the pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. And one third shall fall by the sword all around you. And I will scatter a third to the winds and I will draw out a sword after them. So here he's explaining the three, three piles that he was trying to explain by when he shaved his head and his beard and laid out the pile of hair into three piles he took the one pile and he burns it. And here, he's, here he explains that, you know, one-third of you are going to die. One-third of you are going to be consumed with a famine in your midst. And one-third is going to fall by the sword. And then another third is going to be scattered to the winds. <clears throat> Thus shall my anger be spent. And I will cause my fury to rest upon them. I will be avenged. And they shall know that I am the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal, and I have spent my fury upon them. Moreover, I will make you a waste and a reproach among the nations that are all around you in the sight of all who pass by. So shall it be a reproach, a taunt, a lesson, and an astonishment to the nations that are around you when I execute judgment among you in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken. When I send against them the terrible arrows of famine, which shall be for destruction, which I will send to destroy you, I will increase the famine upon you and cut off your supply of bread. So I will send against you famine and wild beasts, and they will bereave you. Pestilence and blood shall pass through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Not that he's saying that He's bringing a famine. He's bringing a foreign army laying siege on the city and basically starving them out until they have no food. And, it's, and that starvation is the, the famine that he's talking about. So what's the message to us? Isaiah is saying that it, Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed. But he's also carrying the message that God keeps his promises. 
God told him and told him and told him and told him that if you don't repent, judgment's coming. I mean, we, we've seen that in this class all the way since week one back at the 1st of December. You know, when we started looking at Isaiah and then all the way through Jeremiah, it's the same message. And now Ezekiel's basically through silence and his display, he's preaching that same message to people that are already in exile, that will never see Jerusalem again. And yet God's going to keep his promise. He's going to bring judgment. He's going to punish sin, and he's going to destroy the city. But he also let the message that you know, some of those hairs are being sewn up in the robe of his garment. And there's, going to, there's a remnant out there, and that remnant's going to be saved. And God's going to redeem a portion of his people. He still has a plan. He's still going to bring the Messiah through the line of Judah back in Jerusalem. That plan hasn't changed. He's still, still going to bring people back, and he's still going to execute that plan as, as designed. So a remnant is going to be, be saved. God's yoke is easy, but his burden, and his burden is light. God lifted that burden of having Ezekiel lay in such a fixed position for such a long time, and he, he supported him. And in much the same way, you know, Matthew tells us the same story, you know, us following Jesus. Jesus' yoke is, is easy, and, and that burden's light. Doesn't mean it's easy, not, not going to be painless, but his yoke is easy. And finally, the big part of Ezekiel's success in these two chapters is what I would just describe as just showing up to work every day. I mean, can you imagine when God, when you're the prophet and you've, what's your job? I'm going to lay down next to this little display all day long. What am I going to do tomorrow? I'm going to lay down all day long. When I get up, I'm going to bake a loaf of bread. Then I'm going to lay back down. And I'm going to do that for 430 days in a row. Rain or shine, hot or cold, without saying a word to anybody. He's just showing up. I mean, that was basically his job for 13 months. And a lot of, a lot of his success, and I think that goes to show for us too, is sometimes... As t life gets tough, sometimes just showing up means a lot. You bring a lot of encouragement to each other just to see your face on a Sunday morning here at the building. Even if you haven't said a word, there's still a lot of encouragement that you bring just by showing up. And Ezekiel did a lot by showing up to work every day. At that point, let's, let's close, open it up to any questions you might have uh, as we talk, as we finish chapters four and five. Don, you got to. I was just thinking, imagine what Ezekiel must have looked like <coughs> after 13 months of starvation diet, of dehydration, of lying on one side bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what, he, what Don is saying for the benefit of those online was just think about what his appearance must have looked like after those 13 months uh, with living off of a starvation diet and, and minimal water, um, how, much, how much weight he would have lost and almost probably unrecognizable properly um, after that kind of time. That's true. Chris? Mm. And the likes of which I have never even seen. That must be pretty unlikely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he made a reference back to, to verse 9 of chapter 5 when God said, I've never done this before. I'm never going to do it again. This is going to be so, so horrible. Um, it's not going to be done again. 
So that's a pretty extreme comparison. You know, God's let disobedience last for generation and generation and decade after decade. And now punishment's coming. It's going to be harsh. Um, And it was harsh. Anybody else? All right. Um, Don, would you close us in a prayer? that we might realize what lessons are there for us, what encouragement there is there for us to, to do what is proper in your sight. Of all of the instruction that we see there to encourage us in doing what is right and what is moral and what is just, and in recognizing the sinful nature of humanity at that time. Help us to be cautious of the way we live and the way we think and the way we act, the attitudes that we hold. And help us to receive instruction, to be malleable in your hands so that you might correct us through your word through these examples that we might receive the instruction that we need to correct our own way. Forgive us of sins, Father, because we know we're sinful people. And help us each day, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.